to the event Invisible Universe. So here we are. We did it. The team entrusted with the EDIS task of organizing this event is absolutely delighted that the inauguration is taking place today and that to mark that event, the conference entitled Invisible Universe International Conference, which is the linchpin of the entire project, is to be held in parallel. So we have a simple model that we use. It uh, has a standard Big Bang plus inflation. It's our basic framework. We assume things uh, that either come out of inflation or are necessary for inflation, the isotropy, homogeneity, general relativity, or perhaps general relativity plus some modifications, and a set of perfect fluids that their constituents that make up the universe, and we usually characterize them by their equation of state. The Hubble constant shown in the upper left here, that's just the time rate of change of the scale factor. Uh, so it provides the scale on the universe, both the age scale uh, as well as the size scale. Its uncertainty was embarrassingly large uh, up until about a decade ago, about a factor of two. We either were in a big 20 billion year old universe or a small 10 billion year old universe. And at the bottom left, you see these uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, what they look like. Uh, so these are actually reflections of the acoustic peaks in, in the earliest universe as the universe has expanded and structure has formed. But it seems that there is very little room for assuming that dark matter does not exist. The standpoint is that what we want is to have an action principle which you could explain almost to a prehistorical man. You see, if you try to explain to a prehistorical man what is the Einstein gravity action, you will have some trouble because you have to explain what is scalar curvature. And what I want to convince you about is that there is an action principle which is much simpler, which is just a counting function. But, I mean, it has a, a completely different aspect in the sense that instead of being an action principle that brings on data which is local and which is written as a field in a local manner as usual, this action principle will bring on something which is spectral. And what I am trying to convince you about in this talk is that the information that we have about nature, for instance, about the very far distant galaxies and so on, is in fact of the, exactly the same nature. It's an information which is spectral. What I want to sort of convince you is that a better way to look at gravity is like this. You start from space-time thermodynamics as the primary objective, and then you think of gravity as an emergent phenomenon. In this approach, gravity sort of arises as the thermodynamic limit of a statistical mechanics, underlying statistical mechanics, of what I would loosely call the atoms of space-time. So the question is, what is this all about? What is an emergent phenomenon? So an important thing here is, you know, a number of ways about cosmology. One is gravity dominates what's happening in cosmology. And then Newton's big contribution to the universal law of gravity was realizing that gravity, of course, which everybody knew about, applied both to the uh, heavens and the apple falling from the tree. So it's the same laws of physics working in the sky as we see in the laboratory. And all the talks up to now have been very positive. The status of the data, the status of the observations, um, I'm not quite so positive in uh, the status of the model building and uh, our understanding of uh, the origin of dark energy. We are in the dark matter power spectrum and the formation of structure as a function of the amount of invisible matter and dark energy. 
So the question is, uh, if we follow these models, how we can, can we test uh, these models from real data? And one of the options is to explore this dark universe using gravitational lensing effect. Actually, most of uh, GM galaxies are spiral galaxies and they show a beautiful arm-like shape and uh, which obviously suggests rotation and uh, this rotation show clearly that uh, uh, stars are rotating too fast so this is the first evidence of the dark matter in the universe you know that we, we live in a very concordant universe uh, meeting uh, an impressive number of constraints. A very strange universe. Only 4%, 4 percent, 4.5 percent of ordinary matter and two large components, dark matter and dark energy. So apparently we already have full of observables. We have seen already some in this conference, so probably we see more in the in future days. There are really dozens of there from Marco Pashisk effect to baryon flexion, ages, uh, gamma ray bars, supernovae. Some of them are just promised in the future. Some of them are really, really giving us lots of data. So it looks really we have several handles to attack the problem of the energy. affects nature of gravity. Uh, <clears throat> In particular, uh, species, they automatically determine a fundamental uh, scale, a holographic scale, which we call holographic scale for gravity. And this has very important implications for modifications of gravity at large, large distances, as well, as well as short distance gravity. And as you will see, this suggests some, something, some kind of uh, generalized holography. Okay? Is there a super world of new particles? Because uh, according to the theory of supersymmetry, which I will be talking about soon, it's uh, quite conceivable that we know only half of the particle of the world and that the other half of the particle has remained unobserved up to now. Dark matter uh, doesn't actually, is not required to do any of the former things. All that is required for, and all that we know it does, if it is, exists, is to modify the gravity, the uh, dynamics of uh, baryons. And so why not just modify the dynamics uh, without assuming uh, dark matter, the existence of dark matter, just by modifying our physics? <laughs> 